Today we are connecting over 50 participants uh, for the research presentation of joint detailing for improved performance of double T bridge uh, system. Today's presentation is being hosted by the Transportation Learning Network or TLN, a program managed by Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute at North Dakota State University. TLN is a partnership of Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming DOTs, North Dakota LTAP, and Mountain Plains Consortium of Universities, of which our presenter is a member of one of those universities. And there are eight universities in the consortium. South Dakota State University is one of the partners in that consortium. The presentation, the presenter today is the only one that has the capability of projecting audio over the webinar, so please make sure you ask your questions by using the chat box at the bottom of the webinar. Uh, there's no conference call and number for, for number for this event. Now with regard to questions, uh, the speaker, uh, Nadim, will, uh, has two uh, question break points within the presentation and then one at the end. So as you think of a question, insert in the chat box and then he'll get to it uh, at the prompt uh, when the slide uh, for questions comes up. By the way, this session is recorded. Should you want to review part or all of the presentation again, please go to our learning management system at translearning.org. It's where you registered. And do that. That should be available in about a week. A PDF of the PowerPoint will also be available for download from the LMS. Now our topic and uh, and our, our our speaker. Again, the topic today is joint detailing for improved performance of WT bridge system. Presentation will cover research methods and results of the Mountain Plains Consortium MPC-439 research project uh, on this topic. The study conducted by South Dakota State University was intended to resolve longitudinal joint deterioration of the double T precast girder system commonly used in local government bridges of South Dakota. The solution provides for reduced maintenance of sealed joints between the girders and also allows for continuous beam behavior. And our presenter, our presenter today is Dr. Nadim Wabi. Dr. Nadim uh, has served on the SDSU faculty since 1998 and has headed the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department since May of 2012. As department head, he oversees 15 faculty members and staff, 230 undergraduate students, and 49 graduate students. Dr. Wabe also holds a PhD uh, from, Dece from December 1997 and a master's in civil engineering from August 92 from the University of Nevada, Reno, and a bachelor of engineering with a major in civil engineering, June of 1980, from the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. And now, uh, Nadim, Dr. Wabe, I will hit the stop broadcasting and I'll let you begin your presentation. Great. Thank you, Tim, very much. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Tim mentioned, uh, this presentation will cover the results of a study that we performed here at South Dakota State University to address a common issue among existing double T bridges in South Dakota. Uh, the common issue is the rapid deterioration of longitudinal uh, joints. Nadeem, uh, you, might have been, uh, you might have to speak uh, up a little bit. Uh, we're getting a little light uh, uh, sound there. Okay. Let me see. Does it have anything? No, the mic. Okay. Uh, is this better now? Okay. So, uh, uh, as I was saying, uh, the presentation this afternoon covers uh, the results of a study that we performed at South Dakota State University to address uh, a common uh, issue or an existing uh, issue in double T bridges in South Dakota. Uh, the issue being the rapid deterioration of longitudinal joints or what we call shearways that exist between adjacent uh, double T girders. Um, The study was uh, funded by the South Dakota Department of Transportation and uh, the Mountain Plains Cons Consortium University Transportation Center. I also would like to acknowledge the contribution of former graduate student Michael Conrad and also Aaron Bryfogel, uh, research engineer with the South Dakota Department of Transportation. Um, to give you a brief outline of uh, the presentation this afternoon, I will start by uh, discussing or covering what double T bridge systems look like, uh, 
the reason for conducting this study, the motivation for that, and then I will state the objectives of the study. Uh, and before going on to the experimental work that we did, uh, I will cover a couple of uh, previous studies that were performed elsewhere to address uh, a similar issue with joints. Um, can everyone hear me? I see a question saying, I cannot hear, have we started the class? Can everyone hear me? Tim? Denise, can you hear me? Okay. Looks okay looks like the rest are saying yes they can hear me okay so this is a, a local problem okay so uh, I will state the objectives and then I will go over a couple of previous studies uh, that were performed to address a similar issue with longitudinal joints between girders uh, then I will discuss the experimental work that was performed here as part of the study uh, and then cover the results and uh, and the presentation with the conclusions and recommendations well uh, double T uh, bridge girder systems are very common here in South Dakota especially on uh, local roads um, as we know precast bridge superstructure elements are essential for accelerated bridge construction uh, however, those are simple structures, uh, which means that they are adequate for simply supported spans, not for continuous spans. And as a result of uh, their ease of construction and the reduced time of construction, they are very popular uh, with local governments. Uh, uh, they like to use those bridges uh, that are suitable for l rural uh, roads where there is a low uh, traffic volume or truck traffic volume. At the bottom of this slide there is a cross-section of uh, a typical uh, double T bridge girder where the girders are placed side by side uh, stacked side by side and then joined together or connected together at uh, those shear keyways. Uh, those are pictures uh, from one of the double T bridge girders that exist in Minnehaha County in an area close to Sioux Falls. You can see in the upper left uh, picture here this is a, a picture of the uh, bridge deck uh, and you can see that the bridge deck is covered with uh, an asphalt overlay uh, over the deck, which is not necessary. Sometimes those uh, bridges are uh, not covered with an overlay. Sometimes the overlay would be a gravel or asphalt, depending on the intended use. Uh, the picture on the upper right corner is a side view of that same bridge, and you can see how the crash barrier is attached to the edge girder. Uh, the picture at the bottom uh, is a view of the uh, underside of the bridge and you can see the stems of the double T's uh, that are stacked next to each other. Now for this bridge, uh, this bridge uh, has a span of about 60 feet. Uh, when the span length exceeds 40 feet sometimes it is uh, a diaphragm is needed uh, at the middle of the span. Those diaphragms are uh, monolithic, are cast monolithic with the girder at the fabrication yard. Um, this slide shows uh, uh, some typical details of double T bridge decks. Um, the plan view is, covers only uh, two girders that are uh, next to each other, two adjacent girders. Um, and the cross-section at the bottom is taken uh, through these two double girders. And you can see how the girders are stacked side by side. And this is here the shear keyway that is uh, normally uh, a grouted with non shrink grout but before grouting uh, is applied the two girders are connected at discrete 
welded joints in the uh, keyway. Uh, so a cross-section of the keyway away from the uh, joint is shown here at the right uh, lower corner and you can see how the keyway is filled with non-string grout. The keyway is about two inches wide by two and a qu uh, three quarters inches deep and it is assumed that this shear keyway will provide for shear transfer from one girder from the loaded girder to the adjacent girder. Now the welded connection which is so shown here in section BB uh, consists of uh, two embedded angles steel angles that are anchored uh, each uh, one angle is anchored to each girder through this headed stud here so this is one angle in one girder and this is another angle in the adjacent girder and then on top a, a steel plate a quarter inch thick by about one inch wide by five inches long steel plate is welded to both uh, to both angles uh, thereby providing uh, continuity or connectivity between the adjacent girders so uh, it was believed that this shear keyway was adequate to transfer the loads from one girder to the next um, this is a typical cross-section of a, a double T pre-stressed pre-cast girder um, and uh, as you can see the pre-stressing in each stem consists of uh, six half inch pre-stressing strands and then uh, the reinforcement consists of wire mesh uh, one layer of wire mesh bends into the stems to provide shear reinforcement. The other layer is just for flexural reinforcement. In addition to the wire mesh, the deck is reinforced with uh, four number four bars, longitudinal bars that are shown here. And uh, this uh, girder is uh, 40 inches, 46 inches wide by 23 inches deep. This is one of the typical uh, double T girders that are used for uh, bridge construction uh, in, in South Dakota. Spans that do not exceed 70 feet. Now, as I mentioned, uh, that shear keyway was believed to uh, provide adequate transfer of, of load from one girder to the next. Uh, however, uh, it, it was found that uh, this detail was severely inadequate uh, for shear transfer and that was evident by ins bridge inspection. Uh, what happens is that uh, th this shear keyway, uh, keyway uh, starts to crack under applied loads and once uh, a crack develops in the grout uh, water starts water and de-icing agents start to leak through the joint uh, leading to uh, premature corrosion of the reinforcing steel and this is uh, uh, a picture of that same bridge in Minnehaha County that uh, I showed you earlier uh, so the corrosion of the reinforcing steel leads to spalling of the concrete and det premature deterioration of the longitudinal joint. And this causes reduced uh, structural capacity because the adjacent girders do not act as one unit any further once the joint deteriorates. Um, some short-term solutions consist of uh, applying an asphalt overlay uh, and joint sealants. However, th those solutions are temporary. They are also very costly and they have tendency to form reflective cracks. So, as you can see in this picture, uh, the cracks form at exactly uh, uh, right on top of those joints uh, at the spacing uh, uh, at a spacing that is equal to the girder width. Initially those bridges were thought to uh, serve uh, 
for a lifetime between 50 to 70 years. Uh, however, uh, many of those bridges uh, have been found to need replacement after less than 40 years in, in service. Um, now, uh, some of the factors that contribute to reflective cracking is uh, as the uh, joint deteriorates, you end up having what we call a relative deflection between the two girders, uh, and also relative rotation as the girders uh, try to rotate relative to each other under the applied loads and uh, these movements uh, add to the to the problem by uh, making the crack uh, by advancing the crack and making it uh, more severe so the objectives of this study were first to develop new joint detailing for improved performance of double T bridges. We had to devise a new joint uh, that would uh, eliminate uh, the issues that uh, are inherent with the current joint detailing and then to examine the structural performance uh, from both aspects serviceability under repeated loads or fatigue loads as well as strength of both the conventional uh, joint and the proposed joints. So to perform or to accomplish this objective, the second objective, we performed uh, uh, lab tests on full-scale bridge girders under both fatigue loading and as well as monotonic loading, increasing loading to, uh, to determine the strength of, of the joints. At this point uh, I would like to uh, see if there are any questions regarding the material that I have covered so far uh, as far as the joint detailing the issues that we have let me see if there are any looks like all of the questions are related to okay Okay, there are no questions related to the content of the presentation so far. I don't see any. Okay. Yes. Okay, what Making. kind of diaphragms are used to prevent a rotation? Um, if, if we are asking about the diaphragms between adjacent girders, uh, one can insert diaphragms, precast diaphragms, but that would require additional work uh, which local governments prefer not to, to do because of the cost incurred in, in adding those diaphragms. Uh, as far as the bridges that uh, we have inspected, none of them had diaphragms between adjacent joints. Uh, adjacent diaphragms or the end diaphragms. Oh, the end diaphragms, uh, those uh, precast double T's are equipped with end diaphragms. Uh, but the end diaphragm is for individual girders they do not span from one girder to the next uh, so those diaphragms are similar to the diaph intermediate diaphragm let me see if I can scroll back and show you see this diaphragm here those girders each individual girder also has a diaphragm at the ends like this but there are no diaphragms in between the adjacent girders I hope this answered the question now in the proposed detail we looked at inserting diaphragms to prevent a relative rotation and I will discuss that in a little bit are there any other questions <coughs> 
Okay, in that case, since there are no additional questions, I will continue. Now, when we looked in the literature uh, for um, uh, similar uh, cases or similar issues, we found two studies on longitudinal joints between adjacent uh, bulb T, decked bulb T girders. Uh, those are a different breed of, uh, of girders. They are bigger and they are designed for a, uh, higher loads. Uh, so the studies that we came across uh, included experimental work or tests on slabs only that represented the decks. The testing was not done on full-scale bridge girders. Uh, they just uh, samples, slab samples that were attached together and were subjected to fatigue loading and uh, monotonic loading as well for strength. Uh, the first detail, of course, if you look at this slab, it's, it's uh, six inches or more in thick. Uh, the detail here of the joint, if you look at this detail, the edge of the joint is, is not straight. This is to increase the interlock. And then the joint reinforcement consisted of number five bars that are bent in a U shape, U bar joint. And then those uh, U bars are extended from each end. Uh, and then there are two bars inside the interlock. Uh, we call them laser bars to increase the uh, or to provide adequate uh, uh, joint uh, and prevent separation at, at this joint or to reduce the uh, uh, the development length of these U bars. Now this joint is uh, six inches wide and uh, uh, it is filled with non-shrink grout. Uh, tests on this type of joint uh, showed that this joint is extremely adequate for transferring loads and it is a very robust joint that uh, does not crack easily. Uh, a, in a similar study the same researchers looked at uh, headed bars instead of the uh, U-bars and you can see down here the headed bars how they are interlocked inside the joint space. It's the same joint detail or size except that instead of the U-bars we are using here uh, studded or headed uh, studs or headed bars. Um, in both of these studies, as I mentioned, those are uh, uh, those studies addressed the joint uh, in uh, bulb T uh, decked uh, girders. However, this type of a detail does not work for the type of uh, girders we uh, use here for local bridges in South Dakota for short span bridges. Uh, reason being the, the deck is much thinner than this and the deck does not allow for uh, the placement of U-bars. Also the uh, uh, headed bars, uh, placing of the headed bars require additional work at the fabrication plant to ensure that the bars uh, are properly placed and they do not touch while uh, when the girders are placed next to each other. So. Uh, a lot of uh, planning and detailing is needed for this type of, of uh, joints. However, both types of joints performed well for the in their intended use. For our type of girders, the proposed joint detail is presented on this slide. Basically, it's uh, the same section profile here in the joint. Nothing is changed except that instead of uh, having a two-inch wide uh, grouted uh, shear keyway, 
the two girders are placed four inches apart and then the grafted shear wave would consist of uh, this detail inside the uh, red circle in here. Now the reinforcement of the joint would consist of the wire mesh that already exists in the uh, girder deck. So at fabrication the wire mesh would be extended for about six inches outside the uh, deck in, in both girders. So this would allow for four inches overlap of the welded wire uh, mesh inside the grouted joint. Uh, there is also, uh, so the, uh, by, by doing so, uh, the shear reinforcement or uh, would consist of all of those bars that extend into the joint and that would provide uh, about a quarter of square inch of steel per foot. Uh, this steel would, would act as shear studs. In addition uh, to the wire mesh, there are two laser bars included inside, and those are longitudinal bars, about quarter inch diameter each. And those laser bars are used to reduce the development length uh, of the splice because we are splicing two wire mesh layers together. Uh, for the grout, the grout is uh, is the normal or what we call the standard grout uh, that is uh, used uh, by the South Dakota DOT for the uh, traditional or the existing uh, joint detail. It's a 4500 PSI non-shrink grout. Now, in addition to the uh, to this detail here, one can add also a rotational restraint, which is shown here in the blue oval at the bottom of the section. Uh, this rotational uh, restraint consists of uh, a concrete cylinder, a six-inch concrete cylinder, basically that is chamfered on both edges to fit between the adjacent girders and then uh, this concrete cylinder is also fitted with a conduit that would allow for the passage of a three-quarter inch bolt so the bolt acts as a tie to prevent the separation of the two stems the exterior ex the movement outward of the stems away from each other and the uh, concrete cylinder acts as a strut to prevent the inward movement of the two stems relative to each other. Uh, for some reason I cannot see the questions. Okay, now I can. Thank you. Okay, so I say here optional restraint because when we tested uh, the proposed joint detail we tested the proposed joint detail with and without this optional restraint to see if there is any benefit from using those restraints. Now for the test specimens we tested two full-scale specimens. Uh, one specimen uh, was referred to as conventional specimen at, and it included the, the conventional joint that is currently used in South Dakota double T uh, bridges and the other full scale specimen was labeled proposed because we use the proposed joint. Each specimen consisted of two adjacent girders that were connected together by the uh, appropriate uh, joint detail one conventional and one proposed. Uh, the specimen was 40 foot long so we are looking at a span length of about 40 feet and the reason we selected this span length is uh, because it fits well with, inside our lab and we use the standard double T section which is 46 inches wide by 23 inches deep and the reinforcement is similar to what I presented to you before. Uh, and the test configuration looks like uh, this rendering here where the 
girders are simply supported between uh, two concrete supports and the load is applied by a hydraulic actuator the load is applied on one girder uh, and then on one side of the joint on one girder and uh, this would be the trailing girder where we expect the joint to transfer the load from this girder which is receiving the load to the trailing girder the girders were fabricated uh, in here in, in uh, Mitchell at a local uh, fabrication facility uh, by Cretex uh, and Cretex is the only fabrication uh, facility that produces uh, those double T uh, bridge girders so on the left hand side you can see a picture here of the formwork for the conventional uh, specimen and you can see the two layers of wire mesh the picture on the right hand side shows you the detail that was used to create uh, the shear keyway and allow for the extension of the uh, wire mesh outside uh, the uh, girder deck so what they used here is uh, just regular 2x4 to create uh, that detail so there was no need to modify the formwork the steel formwork that uh, the fabricator had in his yard uh, once the uh, uh, girders were constructed they were shipped to our uh, structures uh, facility at South Dakota State University which is the lower structures lab and uh, this slide shows uh, a series of pictures of the assembly process so the uh, in this picture here you can see the uh, semi-trailer truck backing uh, into the lab uh, so the girders were lifted and then they were assembled side by side and we followed the same exact procedure as the one that would be followed in a, in a field application we did not want to make any changes or difference from how it is done in the field and uh, first the two girders this is the, the assembly of the conventional specimen and you can see in this picture here uh, the steel angles that are embedded in the adjacent girders and on top of the steel angles there is this steel plate that is welded to both angles and for welding we hired a certified welder of course uh, you were a graduate student wouldn't be able to produce this quality weld here and after the welded connections were completed the uh, shear keyway was grouted uh, uh, however as you notice in this picture we left some block outs for inspection of the connection during the fatigue testing for the proposed detail uh, the proposed detail requires formwork, uh, simple uh, plywood. This is uh, uh, the, a simple plywood sheet uh, that is placed under the shear keyway. And then uh, th this is here the joint, and you can see uh, the wire mesh overlapping. And once uh, the two girders are in place and the formwork is in place, then the shear keyway is filled in one continuous pore with non-shrink grout this is the 4500 psi non-shrink grout that is specified by the South Dakota DOT um, and this picture here shows the diaphragm the optional diaphragm that I talked about earlier those optional diaphragms are placed at a spacing of five feet you can see one here one over there uh, so we started when we started the test we started with uh, those um, uh, optional diaphragms in place but as the test progressed we started to remove them uh, two, two at a time to see the effect of the of uh, not having those uh, rotational restraints one thing I would like to mention here about uh, uh, the formwork uh, we tried 
to perform the formwork or uh, install the formwork from the top of the girder in order to uh, prevent the need to for access from the bottom of the girder. So what we did was first attach the plywood to the wire mesh of one of the girders using uh, tie wires and when both girders were put together the plywood was lifted in place and then attached to the um, to the uh, wire mesh to form a tight seal. In some places we had to use caulking compound as you see here the caulking gun to seal any wide gaps before we placed the grout. And uh, this is the test setup uh, for one of these specimens. Uh, and as you can see, the two girders here are side by side with the uh, end diaphragm in place. This was uh, provided uh, at the fabrication site. The girder that uh, received the load was labeled girder A and the trailing girder was labeled girder B. And this is a schematic here for uh, the uh, test setup and you can see how the actuator is placed on one side just short of the joint seam. So the load was applied over a steel plate and the steel plate was uh, steel plate edge was right at the edge of the joint. And the reason for this uh, uh, offset is to ensure that maximum shear stress is transferred through the joint. And uh, in addition uh, to the instrumentation that was uh, uh, added to the uh, to the test setup, we placed water dams right on top of the uh, grouted shear keyway. This is to uh, to determine if there is any water leakage and if there is any water leakage at what stage the leak occurred. Uh, the girders or the specimens were heavily instrumented uh, and the instrumentation included uh, surface mounted strain gauges like this one over here. This is to measure the strains in the pre-stressing tendons. We also used embedded strain gauges like this one here. This is to measure stresses in the concrete. We used load cells to measure the reaction under each stem on one side of the of the specimen and you can see here the load cell. Uh, we used cable transducers which are I don't think you can see them very well here but those cable trans transducers were used to measure the mid-span deflection of the of uh, the adjacent girders so there were two of those transducers one for each girder. We also measured the, the relative rotation between the girders by using linear variable differential transformers. Basically those measure deflection, but we installed one at the bottom between the two girders and one at the top over the joint. So knowing the displacement at the bottom and the top and knowing the distance between these two uh, LVDTs, one can determine the rotation. We also measured the relative deflection across the joint by installing this LVDT and that measured the relative rotation between this girder and this girder. Now I should mention also that all girders were placed on a neoprene uh, layer so there is a neoprene layer here just to make sure that uh, the installation uh, or the, the the load would be evenly distributed, the reaction would be evenly distributed under uh, the stem. The loading protocol consisted of three types of loading. Uh, two of them were fatigue loading and one was monotonic until the specimen failed in flexure. Uh, the fatigue loading uh, was uh, Ashto LRFD Fatigue 2 uh, loading and this loading was applied in a cyclic manner. Uh, 
and this type of fatigue loading uh, was used to uh, assess the normal tra truck loads, the effect of normal truck loads on the joint. Then we looked at fatigue one uh, load combination. Again, this is a cyclic load, and uh, we use this fatigue loading to look at the effect of overweight trucks on those joints. And then the monotonic increasing load was used to uh, look at the strength limit state to deter determine the load at which failure would occur in the uh, specimen. The fatigue loading, whether fatigue 1 or fatigue 2, uh, is based on the standard Ashto design truck, uh, which consists of three axles. The front axle is eight kips then the rear two axles are 32 kips each and those axles for fatigue loading the axles are spaced at 14 feet apart uh, in both fatigue loading the impact factor to be considered is 15 percent however the live load multiplier uh, is different for the two fatigue loads. For fatigue 2, the live load multiplier is 0.75, whereas for fatigue 1, the live load multiplier is 1.5. Now, how did we arrive at the load that needs to be applied during the test? We analyzed a hypothetical bridge uh, that is uh, 33 foot wide uh, under the passage of the uh, fatigue load and based on that analysis and using load distribution factors we determined the maximum bending moment that would uh, exist in an interior girder now knowing that maximum bending moment we back calculated the point load that has to be applied at mid span so as we result we end up with the same bending moment so with that procedure uh, the a point load was 21 kips for fatigue 2 and uh, 42 kips for fatigue 1. Uh, for fatigue 2 the load was applied at one cycle per second whereas for fatigue 2 the load was applied at 0.75 cycle per second. The reason for uh, uh, this rate, uh, load application rate, is the capacity of the hydraulic system that we have the higher the load and the higher the displacement the lower the number of cycles that you can apply within a certain time so you can imagine if you want to apply hundreds of thousands of, of cycles this is a very lengthy test it takes um, days if not months now I'm going to take a break to look at your questions see if you have any questions okay what kind of diaphragms are used to prevent rotation um, in the proposed detail I showed you the uh, concrete cylinders that we proposed uh, to use to prevent rotation uh, the second question is adjacent diaphragms or end diaphragms um, as I mentioned there are um, diaphragms within the girder itself and this is to ensure the stability of the of the girder under the applied load uh, when high compressive stresses uh, uh, are incurred however uh, the bridges that I'm aware of here in South Dakota do not have uh, diaphragms in between adjacent girders how would the contractor form the shear key in the deck portion it's a very tight space they would probably need to fill the space below the foam or fill the space with foam in order to provide a form across the bottom of the joint wouldn't they um, for the conventional the answer is for the conventional uh, shear keyway yes uh, sometimes there is a gap at the bottom of the uh, shear keyway that needs to be filled uh, either with uh, as you 
call it here foam or backer rod you can insert a backer rod and then fill the joint with with grout uh, and uh, actually this is what we did in our uh, lab wherever there was a wide gap we filled it up with um, with backer rod to prevent uh, the seepage of the grout through the bottom of the joint another question how was the bottom formed uh, removed at the joint or does it stay in place the form was not removed the form stayed in place unless the owner wants to move the form then there would be a need to access the bridge from underneath in our case if if the form is uh, is acceptable to stay in place and does not form an objectional aesthetic uh, issue then it can stay in place moving on experimental results for the let me let me see there is a question here let me address this question before I move on if the form is rigid it could cause pinch points if the form is rigid this is a very thin the the form is a very thin uh, plywood uh, sheet it's uh, as I recall it's about uh, 3 8 or it's very thin and I, I assume that it would crush under any applied uh, compressive load it, uh, it it wouldn't form it wouldn't result in, in, in significant uh, resistance to the applied loads and um, I'm not sure if pinching would be an issue here okay moving on to the experimental results I'm gonna start with the conventional uh, specimen uh, first with the 21 kip fatigue load uh, we started to observe seepage at uh, about 19,500 cycles or based on the uh, average truck uh, traffic volume that would be the equivalent of 3.6 years of service uh, then the first weld failed at 62,000 cycles or the equivalent of 11.3 service years and the third weld failure occurred at 80,000 uh, cycles or the equivalent of 14.6 service years and in the pictures below you can see the water seepage through the joint when it started to occur and uh, the picture to the right shows I don't know if you can see that there is a crack here in the weld uh, of course uh, the first uh, uh, joint to fail or weld to fail was the closest to the load and then they started to unzip uh, with increased uh, number of cycles um, for the 42 kip fatigue load the first weld failed at 37,500 uh, cycles which is 6.8 uh, services by the way I should mention that after the weld failed we repaired those uh, welds and then we tested the girder under monotonic load to make sure that the stiffness of the girder was the same as the one we started with so there was no issue with the integrity of the repair then we tested the girder under the fatigue one which is 42 kip fatigue load as I mentioned the first failure occurred or weld failure occurred at uh, about 37,000 cycles or 6.8 service years and the weld started to unzip the connections and the fourth weld failure occurred at about 56,000 load cycles which is 10.2 service years also there was significant cracking as you can see here along the joint now during the test the fatigue test we used to stop like at uh, certain uh, uh, points like after 30,000 uh, cycles and then we test the girder under monotonic load uh, 
uh, to determine its stiffness and the stiffness is defined as the applied load divided by the mid-span deflection so what you see here in these plots on the left hand side here uh, this is the stiffness degradation under the 21 kip load or fatigue 2 and you can see how the stiffness degraded with increased number of cycles and the plot on the right hand side shows the stiffness degradation under the fatigue two, uh, fatigue one load and if you look at the rates of uh, stiffness degradation you'll notice that the 42 kip induced more than three times the stiffness degradation rate of the 21 kip fatigue load uh, we also measured relative deflection and rotation. I'm not going to be spending too much time on these graphs. The one on the left is for the fatigue 2 and the one on the right is for fatigue 1 type loading, but uh, the both rotation and deflection increased significantly as the number of fatigue cycles increased. And this is for the conventional specimen. Then we repaired the the wells and we tested the specimen for flexural strength under monotonically increasing load and you can see here this plot here on the left hand side this plot is the load versus mid-span deflection for each girder the red line represents the uh, girder receiving the load and the blue line here represents the trailing girder and you can see how uh, the trailing girder starts to separate from the uh, loaded girder as the uh, welds start to unzip and finally uh, there was complete separation as you can see here uh, along the joint uh, and the girder uh, failed at only 62 percent of the theoretical strength of the combined uh, girders together so uh, the two girders were not able to attain this design strength uh, those pictures here show the complete separation at failure you can see here uh, the joint separation as well as in this picture so this uh, type of joint failed miserably and you can see here the joint separation the experimental results for the proposed uh, detail under the 21 fatigue uh, 21 kip fatigue load we applied 500,000 cycles with the struts that I showed you earlier and that is equivalent to 91 uh, years of service and then we removed those struts and we applied an additional 200,000 load cycles w without those struts which is an equivalent of an additional 36.5 service years uh, we did not notice any water seepage or any visible cracks in the joint under those the, that 700,000 cycle of fatigue loading. Then uh, we applied the fatigue 1 loading which is 42 kips and we applied an additional 100,000 cycles without the struts which is equivalent to 18 years of service. Again there was no water seepage or visible joint cracks showing you here the stiffness degradation <coughs> for the sake of illustration I have superimposed also the stiffness degradation of the conventional specimen so what you see here on the left in the left plot uh, this is for the fatigue 2 type load the red line here represent uh, the fatigue when the struts were in place or the stiffness degradation of the specimen when the struts were in place the green line is for the additional 200,000 cycles when the struts were removed and this blue line shows the stiffness degradation of the conventional joint so it's a striking difference in performance between the two joints uh, for the fatigue one load those are the additional uh, uh, cycles that we applied at 42 kips again the green line represents the proposed uh, detail joint detail without the struts and the blue line represents the conventional uh, stiffness degradation again a striking difference there is no comparison by any means again for uh, deflection and rotation there was no degradation in deflection or rotation with and without the uh, struts in place <coughs> 
and this is why we removed as we removed those struts we did not notice any uh, significant change in in rotation and and the relative deflection so this is why we were encouraged to remove them and continue the test without the struts um, here I'm showing the uh, test results for the strength test and this plot again shows the load versus deflection for the two adjacent girders the red line is the girder that is receiving the load and the blue line is the girder that is trailing and uh, you can see how both girders uh, went together throughout the entire test until flexural failure occurred and the specimens were able to attain their design flexural failure. Uh, the reason there is a difference, uh, I mean, the, the trailing girder is lagging in deflection is because we are measuring the deflection at the mid-span of each girder. So you would expect the girder that is being loaded to undergo a slightly higher deflection than the adjacent girder or the trailing girder and you can see here the flexural failure this is a textbook flexural failure uh, there is wide flexural crack here at the bottom and you can see the flexural failure is manifested by the crushing of the concrete the outermost compression concrete uh, something uh, that did not happen with the other specimen so we can say that the specimen here was able to attain its flexural strength we also looked at uh, the reactions uh, that develop under the applied loads for both uh, the conventional specimen and the proposed specimens. Uh, the reactions were measured uh, at a static load of 21 kips. And uh, the plot here on the left hand side show the reaction force at the different locations. So for example here A West means uh, and girder A the, the, the West stem. And uh, so you can see here under the for the conventional specimen when we applied the load at girder A the stem, the interior stem of girder B which is the trailing uh, girder observed the highest reaction it was higher than the reaction of the stem that exists under the applied load and the outer stem in the trailing girder observed a negative reaction or uplift under the applied load we did not see uplift because the self weight of the girder kept it in place but this is the reaction to the applied load and the reason for this is this applied load here when it is applied the the welded connections here acted as pins and when you have a pin connection between these two girders the load is transferred there would be here an eccentric shear load on girder B so this eccentric shear load is going to induce an overturning moment that would increase the load in the interior stem and reduce the load on the exterior stem. Uh, we were not expecting this until we saw the experimental results. Then we figured out what was going on. And this is not what designers design for actually when they apply the load distribution factors. They don't look at at the joint as a pin that will increase the reaction on the interior stem of the adjacent girder and reduce it on this one. When you look at the reactions in the uh, proposed specimen you can see a better or even distribution something that you would expect from a continuous joint. Uh, in order to verify our results we conducted a finite element analysis and what you see in these plots the the dark bar is the experimental result and the light bar here the gray bar is the result from the finite element model and there was a very good agreement between experiment and analysis in conclusion the proposed joint was capable of mitigating water leakage uh, through the joint for um, many many load cycles for numerous number of load cycles 
Uh, also, the proposed joint eliminated uh, stiffness degradation or any noticeable stiffness degradation due to fatigue, whereas the conventional joint deteriorated uh, in no time. Uh, and as you saw in this presentation, that resulted in significant stiffness degradation where one girder would be loaded more than what the designer uh, would expect. Uh, so therefore, the proposed joint enhanced the continuity between the adjacent girders and we saw that through the flexural capacity. The flexural capacity of the proposed specimen was more than 1.5 times that of the conventional specimen. And uh, the proposed specimen was able to uh, attain the flexural strength, the theoretical flexural strength. Uh, also, the proposed specimen allowed for better distribution to the, uh, of the load to the supports, or what I call more uniform load distribution, uh, what you would uh, be normally designing for. Uh, for recommendation, uh, the current joint detailing should be discontinued for new construction, and the South Dakota DOT has been notified of those results and uh, as soon as we present the final report to them, I believe that they will discontinue, or probably they have already discontinued the use of uh, the current joint detailing. Uh, pr the proposed joint detailing should be adopted for double T bridge systems, similar to those covered in this study. I do not want to extrapolate the results of this study. I would like to limit the results to what we tested here. Um, some might wonder, well, how about cost? How much would the uh, proposed joint cost? Well, we uh, consulted with a local contractor and uh, the result was very pleasing, actually. The initial cost increase was estimated at approximately 3.5% of the initial cost. So this is negligible when you look at the benefits that you would obtain from uh, the new detail. Uh, the joints of the existing double T bridges should be retrofitted to extend the useful life of those bridges. So there are many, many bridges currently in use on South Dakota uh, local roads that are fitted with the um, uh, existing um, or the old joint detail. Uh, those bridges will deteriorate in no time if nothing is done to them to uh, enhance the connectivity between the, the adjacent girders. And actually, we are currently working on a study or research project uh, to look into methods for retrofitting existing bridges. As I mentioned earlier, I do not like to extrapolate the results of this study. However, similar joint details can be developed for other decked bridge girder systems. If, if we are noticing uh, inferior performance due to inappropriate or inadequate detailing of, of uh, those uh, shear connections, then uh, the designers should be looking at uh, a detail similar to what is presented here in this study. And I guess this is my last slide here and now it's time to visit the chat box to see if there are any questions or if you'd like to add questions okay the first question is uh, from uh, Sean in St. Paul Minnesota why was the fatigue cycles not continued the 70 years for each of of the three load cycles. Why was the fatigue cycles not continued the 70 years for each? Are we talking about which test here? Is it the test of the conventional specimen or or the proposed specimen? We never reached 70 years in the convention. Oh, why not continued the 70 years? I, I think we, we reached more than 100 years. If you look, let me go back to the number of cycles. 
that we looked at. Okay, here we go. So we did the equivalent of 91 service years with the struts in place. In addition to that, we did 36.5 service years without the struts. So that is more than 120 years. And then on top of that, we did 100,000 cycles, which is equivalent to 18 service years. In addition to, so um, I hope I answered your question. Oh, just the 21 kip load. If you look at the 21 kip load, we have the equivalent of 127 years of, of loading. So I'm not sure where the 70 years came from that you are asking about. Why not 70 years for the 42 kip loading? Because the 42 kip loading represents those overweight trucks. You do not expect overweight trucks to be on the bridge all the time. We, we just threw in that loading just to see the effect of overweight trucks. Uh, it was not needed, that testing under the 42 kips was not really needed for this study, but we threw it in there just to see the effect of uh, overweight, uh, sometimes agricultural vehicles, if, if they allow the passage of those vehicles all the time on those bridges, what would happen. Design life is 70 years, that's correct. The design life is 70 years, but we wanted to continue the fatigue loading and to see if we would uh, witness any degradation in the proposed detail. Let me go to another question here. Uh, from Joel Flesner, Belfour. Would you recommend this detail for bulb T girders? I would recommend a similar detail. Uh, but again, it all depends on uh, the reinforcement, the deck reinforcement in those bulb T girders. And uh, the designer has to look at uh, the possibility of um, placing reinforcement to prevent cracking from any relative rotation that might occur. So bulb teas are a slightly different animal than those bridges because I guess we expect uh, bulb teas to uh, span uh, longer openings than uh, the uh, double T girders. Again, um, I do not want to extrapolate to bulb T but uh, one thing with bulb T, if, if we are still using welded connections then uh, that detail is inadequate and something else should be used. One question from Brian Olson in Pier. What is the bridge width using proposed joint application for 8 deck unit bridge? 30 foot 8 inches shown in the conventional configuration. That is a good question. We expect uh, the bridge width to be slightly wider when you use uh, the uh, proposed joint. And I have, uh, I don't know if I have access right now to a sketch that shows the width of the bridge, but you can add four inches uh, for every in interior joint to the width of the bridge. So every joint would add four inches to the total width of the bridge. So if you have eight decks, it means you have seven joints. Uh, seven joints times four inches, that is 28 inches. So about two and one third foot, 2.3 foot wide. So that is the, the additional width. This is if, if the standard double T section is to be used. Um, the idea here is to use the 
available or the standard double T so that there will be no need to fabricate or purchase new formwork uh, by the fabricator. Are there any other questions? Nadim, this is Denise. You do have one question that was not answered and um, Where, that was that? what is girder width of the proposed girder? 46 okay. feet plus 4 feet gap between. Okay, uh, let me see here. Where is it? Uh, trying to find the okay there is a question from Brian Olson and Pierre what is girder width of the proposed girder now the proposed girder use the same standard cross-section as the uh, conventional uh, detailing the only difference is the width of the joint and the width of, of the joint in the proposed detail would add four inches to the width of the bridge for each uh, interior joint. I hope that answers the question. Then how wide can the maximum joint opening be? Uh, I'm not sure I understand this. This is from Levi Hilmer from Lennox. How wide can the maximum joint opening be? Four to six inches. The joint opening be. Are we talking about the gap that will be filled with grout, the grouted keyway? If that is what is meant by this question, then uh, the gap at the bottom of the keyway has to be four inches. The new proposed joint. Yeah, the gap has to be, let me go back here to a detail. As can be seen here in this, the gap at the bottom is 4 inches. So this is how the two girders are placed next to each other. And uh, let me see here. This is how it is formed. I mean the keyway is formed and then this is how the joint would look like when the girders are placed next to each other. New question, would you use the optional cylinder for retrofitting existing bridges assuming you could locate and avoid the pre-stressing strands? This is an excellent point. Uh, it's it's very difficult to miss or to uh, drill holes in in those uh, girders and and miss the pre-stressing strands. Now it was even very tricky when we placed those uh, uh, conduits in the inside the formwork. Uh, in order to uh, allow for the passage of the tie rod. So um, I think it, it, conceptually it is possible to insert those uh, uh, restraints, the, the struts, the concrete struts, but I would leave it uh, uh, to the contractor to decide if they can locate and avoid the pre-stressing strands. but that would be one one viable approach if you can miss one question from Brian Olson 
what about variation in the longitudinal direction of the joint and 4 inch cannot be perfectly achieved in the field is there a maximum gap width uh, again we, we realize that uh, the width of the gap varies uh, whether you are using the conventional detail or the proposed detail uh, I would say that the minimum gap should be 4 inches uh, then at some locations it might be more than 4 inches and the reason for the minimum of 4 inches is to allow for the overlap, the specified overlap of 4 inch uh, in the uh, wire mesh layers from each girder. Uh, is there a maximum gap width? Um, actually this is a good question is there a maximum gap width now if if the girder is is highly skewed then I don't know if you want to use that girder in, in the plane uh, we have seen the girders that were de delivered to the lab we have seen a variation of probably a maximum of one inch in the gap width from the closest gap width to the widest gap width maybe I, sh I should uh, let me back up a little bit I'm sorry the maximum gap width should be 4 inches uh, not the minimum the maximum gap width should be 4 inches this is to allow for at least 4 inch overlap of the wire mesh well Sean Black from St. Paul is asking what else would you suggest for retrofitting existing bridges uh, well there are two methods that we are currently looking into uh, we have not tested either one of them we're still designing we're in the design phase uh, one of them involves uh, cutting some of the deteriorated concrete in the existing bridges some of that uh, to, to cut the deteriorated concrete and then uh, provide a uh, either uh, an overlapping mesh in the middle or probably uh, stud uh, some uh, stud bars so we're looking at both of those options and then uh, most probably we will end up uh, testing for both uh, but we need to look at the viability the construction viability because if you cut too much concrete from each girder there would be nothing left on top of the stem so this is something that has to be taken into consideration when I say retrofitting I'm talking about uh, joints that have uh, deteriorated They're not only preventing the relative rotation you want to retrofit the joint itself uh, because uh, some of those existing bridges uh, uh, the concrete around the joint has severely deteriorated thank you Mark I didn't notice that you were attending Okay, this is Denise, and I would like to thank everyone for all the great questions that were asked today. If you have any other questions, we'll just give you a couple seconds. Also, I have provided a link for the evaluation form. When I end this session, when the session is done, you'll be redirected to an evaluation form. But in case you should happen to leave early, please click on the link that's provided. We do need your evaluations on these research webinars because they are fairly new so um, please do that and with that thank you um, to Nadim for presenting this great topic and we look forward to doing more of these in the future uh, Sean is asking if you can provide the slides to use for review yes and they will I be think. provided um, in a short amount of time probably by the um, in the next couple days and then also the recording will be provided on the learning management system. Any other questions? Thank you for attending.
and I will end this session at this time.